All right, so here we are, first and second Peter, that's the class name, a message for today's church from the Apostle Peter. Uh, this is lesson number two in the series entitled The Meaning of Grace, and it's part two of this particular topic that we're covering. And if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, open them up to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be looking at uh, verse 13 and moving forward from there. So in this, uh, in this series, we're studying both the life and the first epistle of Peter the Apostle in order to gain a better understanding of the biblical concept of grace. He talks about grace in his, uh, in his epistle. Uh, and uh, we've talked about grace already. We've said that um, our basic idea of grace uh, is that it is either one of two things. It's either a character trait of God referring to His kindness and His mercy, His generosity, you know, a gracious God, the God of grace. So when we talk about grace, it could be a character trait of God. Or it can refer to what God gives us, uh, unmerited favor, uh, a gift that we don't deserve. So you know, it could be a, an adjective, it can be a verb, you know, it just depends, or a noun rather. It, can, it depends, the, uh, the context of, um, of the lesson itself or the, of the passage itself. But the character of God and His blessings on us, uh, these things also create something within us as we come into contact with Him and the blessings uh, that He generously gives us. In other words, His grace affects us. Okay? His gracious character and His gift of grace, they have an impact on us. Uh, so for Peter, it meant transition from fisherman to apostle to church leader to inspired martyr. That's how his contact with grace inspired him. For those of us who come to know God and His salvation through Peter's preaching, for example, grace has come to mean several things for us as well. So in our last lesson, uh, we said that grace also meant, aside from unmerited favor and so on and so forth, grace also meant security. You know, when we think and experience God's grace, we also experience the secure knowledge that the blessings that He gives us uh, actually come from the only divine Lord. And these blessings grow stronger with adversity. And these blessings will last longer, uh, or will last forever, rather. So to know the grace of God then is to know what security really means really feels like. Someone says, you know, if, you're, if you're touched by the grace of God, how are you supposed to feel? Well, among, among other things, you're supposed to feel assured, secure, safe. So we can look for security and safety in all kinds of people and things and institutions in this world, but Peter tells us that the only way to feel true security is to experience the grace of God. That's, that's the point. That's the point we made in our in our last lesson, you know, the first passage in, uh, in, uh, in 1 Peter. So in the next section of his epistle, Peter explains that grace also means something else. It means sobriety. So you come into contact with grace, what do you feel? Security. You come into contact with the grace of God, what else do you feel? Sobriety, a new sense of sobriety. So as I mentioned in my last lesson, some people think that grace you know, means that God allows a person to simply go ahead and live their lives the way that they have always lived their lives, except now because of grace, this grace thing, you know, they're going to heaven. You know, they, they have this concept. But to know God's grace means that you not only experience security for the first time, you also experience sobriety for the first time. See, while we're lost sinners, we're under the influence of sin. We're under the influence of the world. We're under the influence, if you wish, of Satan himself. And this influence makes us do and say and think all kinds of things. Paul names some of the things that we do when we're under the influence of the world and sin. In Galatians chapter five, he says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit 
the kingdom of God. So Peter says that when we are saved by Jesus Christ, we come under the influence of grace and grace produces sobriety. In other words, we're not drunk with sin anymore, if I was to use that, that imagery. When we're lost, we're drunk with sin. When we are saved, we become sober, sober-minded. We're not, we're not drunk with sin. We're not under that influence anymore. And this sobriety manifests itself in four different ways. And this is the nature of the, or rather the meaning or the sense of the passage that we're going to look at today in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. He's going to explain the various ways that sobriety, spiritual sobriety, manifests itself in our lives. So let's read verse 13. We get to verse 13, he says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober, there's the sobriety, Keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation <clears throat> of Jesus Christ. And so he says, first of all, sobriety manifests itself in holiness. In holiness. You know, soberness requires one to be focused on what is important and ready to challenge anything that threatens what is important to us in our lives. So in our case, what is important is the second coming of Jesus and our resurrection at the time. You know when he says, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. He's talking about when Jesus returns. Stay fixed on that. Stay focused on that. So grace brings you into, into a state of, social, uh, of, of spiritual sobriety and one of the manifestations of this spiritual sobriety is that you're able to stay focused on what's important. And what is important? Well, the return of Jesus. What are you doing with your life? I'm staying ready. That's what I'm doing with my life. I'm staying ready. In the meantime, I got to eat, I got to mow my lawn, I got to you know, get some golfing. <laughs> But what I'm really doing is I, I'm, 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 I'm staying ready. Because the Lord said any time, you, you don't know when He's returning, any time. Any time can be I have a heart attack and I'm gone and I go to my you know, judgment, or He appears suddenly, but either way, any time. And so uh, Peter is saying nothing should distract us from this goal. And spiritual sobriety enables us to Stay focused on that. We're not drunk with sin anymore, tossed around you know, all over the place. Every, not only wind of doctrine, but every temptation, every new frenzy that's going on. You know. How many people this morning, you know, are, I don't know, I didn't read the paper, but how many people are hoping they're going to win the Powerball thing? The Powerball fever that's going around. You know how much emotional, <laughs> never mind wasting your money, talk about wasting your emotions. So spiritual sobriety manifests itself in holiness. He keeps going, verse 14, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am, for I am holy. So grace has put us into this position of receiving eternal life and the blessings of heaven. And in order to receive these things, we must not go back to being under the influence of sin, but rather let ourselves be influenced by the power of grace in our lives. And grace, he says, will lead us to what? It'll lead us to holy behavior. So holy behavior is behavior that reflects the character of God and Christ Jesus and one who truly has known grace. I act in a holy manner because I've known the grace of God. I'm, I'm awake now, I'm, I'm not you know, drunk with sin, I, I'm sober now. Now, of course, just a little explanation. The word holy in the Bible, both in the Old and, New, Old and New Testament, meant to be separate to be separate. Good example of this, in the Old Testament the priests were holy, not because they were good people, they were holy because through their clothing and their work and their selection, 
they separated themselves by the type of dress they had, the type of work they had, the calling they had. They did not do the same type of work and so on and so forth that the ordinary people did. They were called out. They were, they were part of a group. They were picked out, set aside, given a special task by God. They were holy because of their separateness from the day-to-day -day affairs of, of men. So a place or a thing because of, uh, becomes holy, rather, because it is set aside for a special religious purpose. Religious purpose by God. So Peter says, in this regard, that we become holy, how? By separating ourselves from the things that we used to do and we used to say when we were under the influence of sin. And we're not, you know, it's, it's, I use the parallel, if any, if any have remembered a time, um, hopefully in the past, uh, the distant past, where you were drunk, stoned, whatever, not in your right mind because of something you consumed, whatever you consumed, you didn't act the same way, right? Defenses were down, inhibitions were down, you said and did things, tried things, acted things that perhaps you'd be ashamed of now. Certainly I would. Why? Well, you were under the influence. So he's saying you were under the influence of sin. You did all kinds of things that you wouldn't do now, but now that you're under the influence of grace, you're sober. And the things you do, the things that grace leads you to do, they're different than what you used to do. Keep doing these things. So grace leads to sobriety, and sobriety enables us to understand and obey God's commands. And this obedience separates us from the normal activity in the world. This separation from sinful and worldly habits uh, is what makes us holy. You know, uh, again, I, I talk about the Powerball thing because it's all in the news and people are all you know, up in the air about it, but the thing that I have against that, it's unholy behavior for Christians. Should Christians be involved in a feverish attempt at throwing away their money on a one in 292 million chance? One in 292 million plus, those are the odds? I mean, mathematically, that's like zero. It's, it's unholy, it's unbecoming of a Christian to, to be part of a thing like that. Anyways, he's saying, Holy behavior, you, know, you can tell what holy behavior is. And because of grace, you know, we're sober and sober-mindedness brings us into this holy behavior. It says something else also about sobriety. Sobriety manifests itself in fear. You know, one, one of the more sobering experiences of being saved is realizing that if there is a heaven, then there's also a hell. And that's a very sobering experience. What does the psalmist say? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does, uh, there is no one who does good. You know, a lot of people go through life daring death and reviling angels and God, not having a clue that God is going to require their souls one of these days. Grace brings us the understanding of how close we came to being lost forever. Again, I, I mentioned one of the advantages of adult conversion. You know, I was 30 years old when I you know, was baptized. And the, my only, the only thing I say, that the only advantage of, of being converted when you're an adult is you remember what it was like being lost. And I can remember how close I came to just missing the, you know, missing the gospel. One decision here, one decision there. Boy, I know what it's like to kind of peer over the edge and go over the edge into complete darkness and lostness, sinfulness, worldliness. You know? I can remember that. It's like you know, the old story, dodging the bullet. You know, man, alive, I can remember dodging that bullet. And I'm so grateful because of that. Well, grace brings us to that moment where you know, we have this relief, this sense of gratitude. So one thing I think, again, adult conversion enables you to have this sense of gratitude that perhaps as being baptized as a younger person, you know, you're 12, 13, you grew up in the church, you don't have the same sense of, I nearly lost it. 
And so in verses 17 to 21, Peter says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So Peter says that if you really do believe that God is the Almighty Judge, that He sacrificed His only Son for you, that this was God's plan from the very beginning, you know, that you be saved and go to heaven, if you believe all of that, and if you know all of that, then you should behave yourself and walk in fear and respect of the one who has the power of life and death over you. You know, we respect the police officer who pulls us over. You see that red light, right? You're driving down 23rd and then the cop is, you know, he's driving this way and then all of a sudden you look in your rear, everybody looks in their rear view, come on. You're driving down the street, police the car passes you, you always kind of looking in the rear view, you know? And then you see, you see, er, he stops and starts to make a U-turn, right? You know, we all know that, oh no, what I do? Yeah. And he pulls us over and I don't care who you are. You, you, your heart is a little, races just a little faster. Why? Because it's the law. That, that man or that woman is dressed in such a way they represent the law. They have a shield, the law. They have a firearm and all kinds of equipment that says the law. You have broken the law. Yes, I, you know, most people anyways, most people who have some sense are not going to challenge the guy, not going to you know, talk back, yes officer, you know, did you realize you were 34 miles over the speed limit? And my wife answered, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just... <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we fear the law. Well imagine God, <laughs> the supreme law, the, the giver of all laws. Imagine the fear we need to have of Him. I mean, the police officer can just give us a ticket or you know, we may go to jail or something like that, but you know, God can take our life and throw our soul into hell. That's, that's the God we serve. We should have some respect. We should be fearful. And, 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 and uh, uh, Peter says, everybody's going to be judged. Some will be judged guilty and punished. Some will be judged faithful and spared. So we should live, he says, soberly and respectfully, knowing that all, including us, will receive that judgment. So grace leads to sobriety, and sobriety manifests itself in holiness, in fear, you know, meaning respect. Thirdly, it manifests itself in love. You know, grace produces new behavior, new behavior. There is new behavior seen as things we don't do anymore, like Paul was saying in Galatians 5, you know, immorality, hatred, carousing, so on and so forth, we don't do those things anymore. And as Peter explains, there is now things that we do which were not evident before. And he explains in verse 22, he says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So here he explains that the very special love that Christians have for one another, produced by the word of God in their hearts, this is life. It is a seed bearing, you know, uh, I mean a fruit bearing seed. Grace is planted in us and it bears fruit. In the world we loved ourselves and sin and the things of this world, but under the sobriety that we now have because of the influence of grace in our life, God through His holy word is producing a special kind of love that only Christians have. You know, I remember when we were in Europe just a little while ago and you know, the problems we had, you know, they had the terrorist attacks and we were caught between, you know, we couldn't get out of London and 
We had to change all of our plans. It was kind of a hectic. I don't think we were ever in any danger, but it was hectic. All our plans ruined in the middle of the trip. We had to, you know, uh, and, and we hadn't been with the church. You know, we hadn't been the, with the church for days. You know, we didn't go to a Wednesday service. We were too far in London to, to go to that and so on and so forth you know, because of the travel and everything. And when we finally arrived in Geneva and then, when we, and then a couple of days later, finally the seminar started and we were together with the brethren, what a relief it was to be with the brethren. What a wonderful thing it was with Christians we never met before. One, there was one person I knew from before, Doyle Key, but other than that, I didn't know any of these brethren. But within 10 minutes it was like, yeah, right, this is home. These are my people. <laughs> I'm feeling right at home with these people. You know, thousands of miles and several cultures removed. And yet in a moment, yeah, these are the Lord's people. Wow, I'm feeling good now. I can do this. I can do this now. So we're no longer seduced by the love of the flesh and the vanity of life, but now quite deliberately, we choose to love our brethren with a forgiving and sacrificial love that reflects the love that Jesus showed for us on the cross. So what's the goal in church? The, you know, we're going to have the budget presentation and we have to have that obviously uh, each year because you know, the church handles money and, and the elders want the church to know well, what we're doing with that money and that's fine. You know, once a year I don't think it's too much to have that type of report. But that's not what we're doing, right? We're not handling money. It's not what we do. That's just a side thing. What we do is we're learning how to love one another <laughs> like Christ loved us. That's what we're doing. That's what we're learning. That's what the goal of our teaching is. That's what, our, that's what our activities are trying to promote. It's certainly what the classes are doing for the children. So the word of God produces agape, this, <clears throat> this love, which is a love that is unselfish, non-sexual, uncompromising, a kind of love that we have never experienced before. So grace leads to sobriety, which leads us to holy, living, respectful attitude, a love that we have one for another. And then um, sobriety manifests itself in growth. Remember I said four things, so there's the fourth thing. Sobriety manifests itself in growth. Chapter two, the spiritual sobriety generated by God's grace provides the right environment and motivation for personal growth. Now the purpose of sobriety is to allow us the state of mind and spirit that can uh, uh, perceive and experience why we were saved in the first place. So let's see uh, Peter, how he expresses this idea. He says, therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, that's the old life, that's the old way that we dealt with uh, each other. Notice? Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. All those things are things that people do one to another. You can't slander in a vacuum. You can't have hypocrisy if you're just by yourself. These are all things that we do one to another. So you know, in your old life, this is, this is how sinners deal with one another. But he says, but like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it, you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. He says, and coming to Him as a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through, uh, through, Jesus, through Jesus Christ. So Peter says that once you begin to live in holiness and respect for God and love, uh, and you begin to fulfill the original purpose of God's grace, and that is to build you up in the church. That's the point. Remember I said, what are we doing here? It's not about money. It's not about handling the money. That's just a side thing. It's about how we love one another. The witness that we make, certainly Jesus, the Son of God, but the witness, you know, the actual practical witness we make is come and see how we love one another. C come to our family, to our church, and see how we can love you. 
That's what we're doing. That's what Peter is saying here. Grace ought to be able to uh, 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 develop this, or cultivate rather, this, this skill in loving in each individual. You know, we often say the church is not the building. The people are the church, and that's true. But Peter goes one step beyond this saying, not only, and, and says not only are the people the church, but the purpose of these people in life is to make pleasing offerings to God. That's the purpose of the church. Paul explains, you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and in Ephesians 5, 15 to 20, that these sacrifices consist of two things, and I've written, that, I've written them down. Once a holy style of living filled with service. Romans 12, right, verse one. Offer yourselves, he says, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. What am I doing? Well, I'm, I'm offering my life. Everything I have, I'm offering it to God as, as a spiritual sacrifice. And what else am I doing? Well, a joyful heart full of, full of spiritual praises. This is the actual task of the Christian, he says. So he then goes another step by describing the true identity of these people who are the church. That's what they ought to be doing. But he says something else about them, verse six. He says, for this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you, and here's, here's the point I'm focusing on, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You realize he's talking about us here. That's who we are. And then he says, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of the darkness into this marvelous light. That's your purpose. This is who you are. This is what you ought to be doing. Why? You were called out of the darkness. You know, out of, out of, out of, out of uh, you know, uh, sinful drunkenness. You know, Drunk with sin, you've been called out of that. You've been sobered up. You've been, you've been dusted off. You've been given a new identity and a new purpose. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now, he says, you have received mercy. You know, the priests and the Levites in the Old Testament, they were not allowed strong drink while they served in the temple. They had to remain sober in order to carry out their tasks. The point that Peter is making is that grace leads us to spiritual sobriety that we need to function in our new role. As what? Well, our new role as the chosen race. We're the chosen ones. Christians are the chosen ones. Our new role as royal priests, meaning priests serving the king. You had priests serving the people. We're not priests serving the people. We're priests serving the king. You know, an interesting note is that the kings in the Old Testament, the kings were not allowed to offer sacrifices. Remember when Saul went ahead and offered the sacrifice anyway? God took the kingdom away from him. Why? You're not allowed to offer, you're the king, but you're not allowed to offer sacrifice. You should have waited for Samuel. He was allowed, he's the prophet. He was allowed to do it, but you're not allowed to do it. And conversely, the priests couldn't be kings. Notice, go through all the kings in the Old Testament, United Kingdom, Divided Kingdom, none of the, none of the kings were priests. Only Melchizedek in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ in the New Testament were both king and priest. Those are the only two characters. Well now, Peter says, Christians are added to that number. Melchizedek in the Old, Jesus in the new, and now you people, you people, you Christians, you're both kings, royal, and priests. That's why he refers to the church as a holy nation. All these terms, holy nation. So these were titles enjoyed by the Jews in one way or another for a time, but now, Peter says, through the grace of Christ, these titles have been conferred on those who believe and follow Jesus forever. 
they have it forever. So like any other role or position, the person has to kind of grow into that situation. And Peter says that through the sobering effect of grace, we are prepared to enter into and function in our new roles as God's chosen, holy nation of royal priests. And what are we to do? To build His kingdom through holy living, through praise, and through Christian witness. That's the task of the church. If a preacher, if young preacher came to me and says, well, I need, a, you know, I need a scripture passage to preach next Sunday about what is the role of the church? What should the church be doing? Where in Acts should I be looking? Well, you shouldn't be looking in Acts. You should be looking in 1 Peter. Because Peter is the one that explains what we ought to be doing, quote, as a church. Acts describes the building of the church, the actual physical building of the, of the church in the, in the New Testament. Okay, so the grace of God is at work before, during, and after salvation. Let me explain. It's at work before, why? Because God from the beginning of time has been planning and working towards the salvation of sinners. You know, I've said in other places, while I hated God, while I was being disobedient to God, while I, I mean I, I don't mean just general sinner, me, Michael Mazzalongo, while I was making fun of God, making fun of Him, making fun of the Bible, making fun of Jesus Christ, making fun of Christians, while I was doing that, God was planning for my salvation. And while you were doing whatever you were doing, He was planning for your salvation. From the beginning of time, He was planning for it's easy to say general salvation, but when you start putting names on it, you, you from Texas and you from Idaho and you from Canada and you from New York, you know, he was planning your salvation. And then during grace is working, during our moment of salvation, when we believe, when we confess, repent, when we're baptized, the grace of God washes away our sins, if you will and fills us with the Holy Spirit. And when I say the grace of God, I'm saying by the grace of God, because of His graciousness, He does this at that moment. And then after we're saved, even after the moment of our salvation, the grace of God continues to be effective in our lives. It provides a feeling and a knowledge of security and reassurance that God will fulfill His promises to us. Grace means security and it releases us from the influence of sin and leads us to so spiritual sobriety which manifests itself in various ways in our lives. Holy living styles, a new fear or respect for God, a different kind of love for those who believe, this agape, uh, agape love, and then of course development in our new role in the church as royal priests, offering sacrifices of service and praise and witness. And you know that fourth thing, you know, as uh, royal priests, I, I've used that imagery before, especially in dealing with sinfulness in my own life. Sinful habits, sinful things, sinful attitudes, sinful words, sinful you know, responses, if you wish. Because I imagine if I'm correcting this thing in my life and it's costing me something, you know, if it's something, uh, you know, if it's something I do, a habit or something, breaking a habit is, is a very, you know, it's a hard thing emotionally, psychologically, you know, because you're so used to doing one thing, you, you want to start doing another. And I begin to realize, <coughs> excuse me, I begin to realize as a royal priest of God, that's what I am, I need to take myself a little more seriously as a Christian of who I am. I don't mean holier than thou or being self-righteous. I don't mean that. I mean take myself seriously as, as the Bible has told me who I am. Peter is telling me this is who you are. And so when I'm making an attempt at correcting something in my life, you know, purifying some area or whatever it is, I see that as myself laying that thing down on the altar and making an offering of that to God. And the fact that somehow giving that up hurts me you know, psychologically, 
causes me some sort of physical <laughs> withdrawal, perhaps uh, you know, emotionally, uh, I have to deal with the fear perhaps of letting something go or doing something better or perhaps giving up a pleasure that I thought was okay but is not okay, you know, whatever. All the things we go through when we repent, when we try to do better, that pain, that effort that's going into that thing, as a royal priest of God, I see myself putting that on the altar and offering it up. And I say to myself, this is, this is what my life is about. This is really what my life is about as a Christian. So we need to kind of take ourselves just a little more seriously as Christians and what we are doing as Christians. We're spiritual people, we're doing spiritual things. Okay, um, that's the end of this particular section. We're going to keep going. The meanings of grace, Peter has some more things to say about what grace actually means and does in our lives and we'll continue that in our next class. Thank you very much.